Hello and welcome to the May IASB Update podcast. My name is Claire Short and I am part of the communications team at the IFRS Foundation. Today I'm joined by Hans Hugevorst and Sue Lloyd, Chair and Vice Chair of the IASB respectively. And we'll be talking about topics covered at the board meeting held from the 24th to the 27th of May 2021. First, let's look at the projects the board was asked to take decisions on. The first of these is the primary financial statements project. Hans, the board has made good progress on this project over the last few months. What decisions did you make at May's meeting? Well, we picked up where we left off in April, uh, continuing our discussions on whether to revise or not the proposed changes to the statement of profit or loss based on the feedback to our consultation. And originally we proposed to add three new subtotals to the statement of profit or loss, and we previously had already decided to keep one of those operating profit as outlined. Uh, and at this meeting, we considered revisions to the remaining proposed subtotals, financing and investing. And the board ended up agreeing with some staff recommendations, first of all, to retain the proposal to introduce financing and investing subcategories in the statement of profit and loss, but not to adjust the definitions of the financing and investing categories for the statement of cash flows. Secondly, we agreed to retain the proposal of adding a subtotal of profit before financing and income tax. And finally, we agreed to include cash and cash equivalents in the investing category. We also discussed some additional topics related to the financing and investing categories and subsequently decided not to make the subtotal of profit or profit before financing and income tax optional, as had been proposed by the staff and to require an additional line item for income and expenses from investments. And finally, we examined some measures that would broadly define items to be included in the financing category. However, we did not agree with the staff proposal and suggested that the staff conduct more work and testing to define this category. All this just to show that the board does not always blindly fold, follow the uh, recommendations by the staff, although we often do. <laughs> um, our discussions on primary financial statements will continue at a future meeting. Staying with you, Hans, the board was also asked to take decisions regarding the second comprehensive review of the IFRS for SME standard. In March, the board decided to move the project from research phase to the standard setting phase with the goal of alignment to the full IFRS standards while keeping the SME standards simple enough for small and medium-sized companies to apply with ease and accuracy. Can you share the details of this month's decisions with us, please? Yes, well, when we decided to move this project to the standard setting phase and, and we gave the green light for work to begin on creating an exposure draft, we asked staff to seek additional feedback from accountants and auditors on their experiences in applying the IFRS for SME standard. And at this meeting, we heard a summary of their responses. Key messages that came out of this research included that the SME standard should be kept simple, as we intended, that SME preparers appreciate a stable platform for maintaining alignment with IFRS standards, so don't make too many changes. And they also appreciate the substantially fewer disclosures compared to IFRS standards. All not too surprising. And next, we looked at specific sections of the SME standard that could be aligned with IFRS standards, and the discussion focused mainly on its underlying principles. Staff proposed a plan to adjust this section, called Section 2, to align more closely with the underlying principles of the full IFRS standards, which are described in the conceptual framework. However, the board decided that Section 2 would remain authoritative, unlike the conceptual framework. And we also agreed to add a principle for classifying financial assets based on their contractual cash flows and to retain the concept of undue cost or effort. Thank you, Hans. The last project on which the board was asked to make a decision this month was FICE, Financial Instruments with Characteristics of Equity. Sue, please tell us what the board decided after it asked the staff to further develop their recommendations on priority of liquidation. 
Sure. So this month, the staff came back to the board with some revisions following the discussion that we had last month, and the board made decisions on two points. And just to be clear, given where we're at in the deliberations, these new proposals would ultimately be put out for comment um, in a in another exposure draft. But but what we decided was um, two things. Firstly, that companies would be required to disclose differences in priority for their financial instruments, and this is all financial instruments within the scope of IES 32, and also that there should be disclosure for the financial instruments of the terms and conditions of the instruments that affect the priority in liquidation. And just to point out something here, people might remember that in our discussion paper, we had proposed a um, disclosure on priority and liquidation. And quite a few came back and sort of said, this idea of liquidation of a group of companies is, is a bit artificial because it's individual companies that go into liquidation, not groups of companies. And so what we're looking at here is a relatively um, simplistic analysis. We're not asking people to think about the sort of structural subordination caused by groups. We're also not asking companies to sort of analyze the likely effect of actions of bankruptcy courts or the operation of law. All we're doing is saying, based on the terms in your financial instruments, is there contractual subordination? Is there security? So it's, it's a relatively simplified type of analysis, and we're going to try to make that clear when we ultimately do put this out for comment. Thanks, Sue. The board also continued its discussions on feedback received to its goodwill and impairment and lease liability projects. Hans, can you summarise what the board heard on the first of these, that's goodwill and impairment? Yes, well, this month we discussed the feedback regarding the board's tentative decision, which, as people will recall, passed by a very narrow majority to retain the impairment only model of accounting for goodwill rather than to reintroduce amortization. And I think it's fair to say that responses are extremely mixed. Our stakeholders remain completely divided on this issue. While many agreed with our tentative decision, others and many others advocated for the reintroduction of amortization of goodwill. We also heard that respondents generally agreed that the impairment test in IS 36 could not be made more effective at a reasonable cost. And some stakeholders, however, submitted some suggestions on how to improve the application of this test. In our March 22, 2020 discussion paper, we proposed simplifications to the impairment test, uh, which included removing the annual quantitative impairment test and the estimation of value in use. Perhaps surprisingly, most respondents disagreed uh, with removing the annual quantitative impairment test, citing concerns about the effectiveness of the test, which could be further reduced, and the minimal cost reduction that it would involve but some of the other simplifications were agreed to. Well, now that we have received a summary of the feedback on our preliminary views, we will begin to examine possible adjustments to those views, starting with the project scope and objective. And this will be followed by a detailed discussion on whether the decision not to reintroduce amortization of goodwill will be final or not. And that decision is, of course, particularly important with regards to convergence with U.S. GAAP. So we will also be talking to our colleagues from the FESB very soon. This will all take place after I have left the organization. Yes, so that's something that will be picked up by the rest of the board members and our, our new board chair, Andreas. Over to you, Sue. Can you fill us in on what the board heard in terms of feedback regarding the lease liability consultation? Yes, so in November last year, we published an exposure draft on uh, some narrow scope issues regarding the initial and the subsequent measurement of a lease liability when a company enters into a sale and leaseback transaction. It's a narrow scope issue, but there was a lot of interest. We got nearly 100 comment letters in response to the exposure draft. So this month, we got the um, summary of the feedback, basically, and we heard that most respondents agreed that we do need to look at making an amendment to IFRS 16, the leases standard, to include um, some new measurement requirements to deal with this issue. And we also received um, some helpful suggestions on how we might um, achieve this or what amendments we might make. But I do think it's fair to say that there was quite a bit of diversity in the feedback that we got on some of the specific elements of the proposals. So we'll have a bit of work to do at future meetings to really work out what the best path is 
to move forward on this topic. Thanks, Sue. It was a busy agenda this month. Um, the board also heard back from the team working on the dynamic risk management project. This was after the board asked the team to develop some new proposals for revising the core model at last month's meeting. Sue, please fill us in. Yeah, so basically this discussion this month was to agree what we would look at and the order in which we would look at it moving forward in the deliberations. So people probably might remember that this is a project all about trying to get better transparency about how banks manage their dynamic interest rate risk management strategies for portfolios of assets and liabilities. And last month, the staff gave us an overview of feedback that we've received on some targeted outreach that we've been doing with banks. Uh, where we've been talking about the core model that we've been working on. And in that outreach, we identified some areas that we thought we really need to revisit to try to address some of the issues that were identified during those outreach meetings. So this month, the staff identified three key areas of further development for the core dynamic risk management model that they think we need to look at more closely. And also they made suggestions on the order in which we should consider these topics. And, and we agreed with what the staff proposed. So what they suggested was firstly, we look at whether the core model could incorporate risk limits as opposed to a single outcome approach, which was a model that we've been investigating. Also that we'll look at if the model could incorporate the designation of a layer of prepayable assets as opposed to designating a proportionate amount. And finally, we'll consider whether recognising changes in the fair value of derivatives and other comprehensive income is the appropriate mechanism to use in all circumstances or whether we need to look at other mechanisms. So the staff are going to explore possible changes to the DRM model to address these challenges and they'll come back to the board, starting with that first area, probably in Q3 this year. Thanks, Sue. Staying with you, the board also discussed IFRS 17, which is our insurance standard. And can you catch us up on the details around that? So insurers are going to start applying IFRS 17 at the, for their 2023 financial statements. And we know that many of the insurance companies have taken up the option that we've given them to wait to apply IFRS 9, the new financial instrument standard, until 2023 as well, so that they can apply those two new standards at the same time. And the issue that we were looking at at the board meeting this week is related to the comparative information that arises if you apply both 17 and 9 at the same time because of differences in the approach to transition and comparatives in those two standards. So in particular, if an insurer starts to apply both IFRS 17 and IFRS 9 in 2023, then in their comparative financial statements, if they choose to restate the comparatives for IFRS 9, then in some cases, because IFRS 9 isn't applied to financial assets that get de-recognised before 2023, accounting mismatches can arise because of the old IES 39 accounting that's being used for those de-recognised assets. Now, now that insurers are getting advanced in their implementation in preparation for applying those two standards, they've got a better idea of the magnitude of the mismatches that could arise because of those differences in treatment. And it's turned out to be quite big for some of the insurance companies. But I should point out that it's not an issue for all of the insurance companies. For example, those who are already um, measuring their insurance contracts on a current value basis. And also it's a pretty focused issue that applies just for that short period of time in the comparative financial statement. So it's a big deal for some, but I'm just trying to put it a bit in context. So at this month's meeting, we discussed whether the board should and can help the insurers and in turn their investors by making a change to improve the information that the insurers would present in the comparatives by giving them a targeted amendment that would address this mismatch issue and result in information being provided in the comparative financial statements that would look more like it will once IFRS 9 is applied in full from 2023 financial statements. Now, when we discussed this, we did sort of comment on the fact that we need to be careful. Insurers are already well advanced in implementing these standards, and we have to make sure that by introducing changes at this late stage that we don't inadvertently disrupt implementation for some while helping others and also that there aren't bigger consequences of this issue than we intend. So it's, you know, it's tricky to get the scope of it right. 
So we had an initial discussion at the May meeting. We weren't asked to make any decisions at the May meeting, but rather to discuss the idea and the things that we want the staff to think about. And the plan is that at a future meeting, the board will vote on whether we should propose a narrow scope amendment to IFRS 17 and what the exact parameters for that would be. But really the focus that we ask the staff to look at is on enabling insurers to apply IES 39 to these financial assets, which is the case now, but to introduce an overlay that would address accounting mismatches that arise in this comparative period. And we're not looking at changing IFRS 9 in any way at all or changing the overall approach to transition, just dealing with this mismatch issue with an adjustment really to the accounting to IES 39 for some of these financial assets. Thanks, Steve. Before we wrap up, The board heard an update from the discussions at the recent Interpretations Committee meeting. Uh, Can you fill us in on what the board heard this month? Sure. So this month, the board discussed two agenda decisions that were agreed by the IFRS Interpretations Committee recently. The first was about IES 19, the Employee Benefit Standard, about attributing benefit to periods of service. And the second was a hedge accounting question to do with hedging variability in cash flows due to real interest rates applying IFRS 9. So basically, the board was updated on the discussions of the committee and we reviewed the agenda decisions. So these finalised agenda decisions have now been published in an addendum to the April IFRIC update that's available on our website now, dated May. And so... If you are interested in the work of the Interpretations Committee, I'd encourage you to listen to our quarterly IFRIC podcast that I record with my colleague, Petrina Buchanan. Uh, The first episode for the year is available on our website now. It's on YouTube and various podcast players. The next episode covering the second quarter of 2021 will be available in July. It's good stuff. Claire, I know you've got a dog. Maybe you could listen to our podcast while you're walking your dog. Absolutely. I really do enjoy the IFRIC podcast. I find it really interesting. But that wraps up our discussions from the May board meeting. Thank you, Hans and Sue, for joining me today. Next month will be Hans's last podcast with us as he steps down as the chair of the International Accounting Standards Board at the end of June. But to mark the occasion, we'll be chatting to him and reflecting on his 10 years at the helm. Before we say goodbye, there are a couple of other developments from the past month to bring your attention to you. First, we published the long-awaited management commentary consultation in the last week of May. We're looking for comments from stakeholders on our proposed comprehensive framework for companies preparing management commentaries that are aligned with investors' information needs. You can visit ifres.org for more information on this consultation. Then, if you're listening to this as it's released, you still have a day or two to register for the annual IFRS conference, which will be held virtually on the 3rd and 4th of June. Again, you can visit our website, ifres.org, for more information. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the IASB Update podcast. You will find all past episodes of this and our other podcasts, including the IFRIC podcast, on our website, on YouTube, on Spotify, and your podcast player. If you have any comments or suggestions for the podcast itself, please email me on communications at ifres.org. Until next time, keep well.